After a planning period, Bethune opened her school on October 4, 1904, in a small, run-down cottage. With only 15 cents and faith, she started classes for five girls, 8 to 12 years old. Each paid 50 cents for tuition. From the beginning, Bethune asked African Americans for help, and they supported her. Many of these volunteers cooked and sold food to raise money. For vital supplies like mattresses and furniture, Bethune rummaged through hotel trash dumps. Bethune often spoke at public meetings to promote her activities and recruit students. In these sessions, she emphasized the need for education and also talked about the historical contributions of African Americans to promote pride and achievement. As Bethune continued to talk with African American women about the importance of knowledge, Moore decided to study. Within two years, enrollment reached 250 pupils and Bethune had to expand into an old building next door to have enough room. She started evening classes for adults and stretched the workload on her small teaching staff. To keep the school going, Bethune donated as much of her own money as she could. For more space, she negotiated with the landowner of an old dump site to purchase the property for $250. They set up a payment plan of $5 per month. Students helped haul junk away to clear the land from the place they called Hell's Hole. For more support, Bethune contacted the wealthy employers of her students. She convinced businessman James Gamble to pay for a brick classroom building. Even when she was trying to uh, raise money from wealthy whites, she had to, uh, she said, swallow many bitter pills because of some of the negative things they would say about African Americans. She said, but she did that because she had her goal in mind. Not that she agreed with what they were saying, but this was the only way that she felt that she could be successful. And what she uh, said that if she would sacrifice uh, her temper at that time, she could achieve her goal. In October 1907, the school moved to this unfinished location. Bethune named it Faith Hall. Her numerous speaking engagements drew a wide-ranging audience and some interested backers. A white businessman who ran a sewing machine company made an appointment to see her, and her dedication convinced him to pay for a new hall. He left a large donation in his will. To raise more cash, Bethune started an agricultural course for students who planted vegetables and sold them to residents of the town. Bethune took on many challenges. When she found out there were illiterate African-American families working in rural labor camps outside Daytona for low wages, she started a chain of missions. Their workers learned how to read and write and other survival skills. The most important issue of her life now was establishing a first-rate school. Bethune relied on faith and kept going against odds. Her policy to accept every student who wanted to learn caused more overcrowding. She looked at the plight of African-American women. Uh, even they thought about African-American males during the Reconstruction period because they did get the right to vote. African-American women did. And our legacy from slavery were, was that we were basically immoral to a certain extent. So her idea was to bring the African-American woman's plight to the forefront, to educate them. And if you educate the black woman, uh, if their image is updated, then you educate generations. Because she's still doing her, she was part of that uh, cult of domesticity although she was progressing. She saw that a woman had a lot to contribute in the home, and that was to rear the children. And what she saw it as, as that if you educate a woman, you educate a generation. So I, this basically, to me, was the reason she selected educating girls, although some boys attended uh, her institute. In the midst of all this, there were problems at home. Her husband had never been excited about the school. They couldn't resolve their differences about Mary spending so much time away from home, and in 1908, 
the marriage ended. Her husband returned to South Carolina. Now Bethune was free to promote her activities even more. Her public meetings drew more people and gradually she made contacts with wealthy white tourists. They invited her north when the winter season ended in 1909. In New York City, they introduced her to the wealthy Guggenheim and Vanderbilt families. They also arranged for Bethune to visit a millionaire she met in Daytona, John D. Rockefeller Sr. Rockefeller established scholarships for her brightest students and provided a grant for the school through his family's foundation. Segregation not only made it tougher for African Americans to attend quality schools, it also endangered them. After one of her students got sick, Bethune took her to an all-white hospital because it was the only one nearby. At first, the hospital refused to treat the girl. After Bethune pleaded with them, they reluctantly decided to admit her, but refused to let Bethune visit. This insult, plus the poor medical treatment her student received, angered Bethune so much that she decided to undertake the hardship of finding funds to build her own hospital. After funds were raised through school events, she persuaded industrialist Andrew Carnegie to make a donation. The Patsy McLeod Hospital opened on campus in 1911. She named it after her mother, who died the same year. Now Bethune was again concerned with improving her school. She called a meeting with the Board of Trustees. Her plan for accreditation as a high school was rejected by several board members. They told her African Americans didn't need more than an eighth grade education. She had to do whatever. Uh, she attempted to petition the board. Then when she found out that the board, uh, being all white, was only going to uh, validate those kinds of things that they felt suitable for African Americans, she had to then reach out into other areas. Bethune vowed to take this issue outside the boardroom. She enlisted the help of powerful businessmen. In 1913, the board finally endorsed her plan for high school education for African Americans in Daytona. By now, Bethune's reputation as an educator and civil rights spokesperson was widely known. The school was dangerously overcrowded. To ease the pressure, Bethune held community meetings and met with churches and organizations. A wealthy New York tourist responded by donating $80,000 for a dormitory. To raise more funds, Bethune got on her bicycle and went house to house, knocking on doors of strangers. Ten years later, the school was still in financial trouble. In 1923, Bethune's school merged with the all-male Cookman Institute, and the name changed to Bethune-Cookman College. She retained her presidency and ran the day-to-day -day affairs. The merger gave the Methodist Episcopal Church control over finances and the campus grounds. By 1927, Bethune-Cookman was moving toward accreditation and financial stability. This gave Bethune the chance to be more active outside the campus. That same year, members of two women's groups Bethune was active in combined funds and sent her on a vacation to Europe. British leaders were aware of Bethune's stature and they gave her a warm welcome. Lady Nancy Astor, the first woman member of the British Parliament, was one of the many influential people who met her. Her only unpleasant experience happened while in a restaurant. White Americans complained that they didn't want Bethune eating in the same room. Management made them aware there was no public segregation against African Americans in England. When the educator returned to school in October, she found an invitation waiting for her to attend a luncheon at the home of the governor of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It was hosted by his wife, Eleanor. <laughs> 